Ah, so, it's uh, Malik and I back, and after some shenanigans, we're here to discuss Season 2 of Marvel Netflix's Luke Cage. And uh, what we decided previously is that before we even get into this season, we're just going to give a brief sort of discussion about how each of us feels about Season 1 and going into Season 2 for the first time, what our thought was, and uh, Malik, I believe, went first, so uh, go ahead. Alright, so, um... I liked the first season of Luke Cage, um, but like I've said many times, the second half damn near kills the season for me. Um, uh, I think for the first five or six episodes, it was really good. It was um, like an interesting and bold black exploitation kind of show that had a lot of really poignant and, uh, and interesting stuff to say about black community and black culture as a whole. And um, I, uh, I really like Mike Coulter in the lead role. I liked him a lot in Jessica Jones. Um, uh, just This isn't a real issue so much as something I really wish they'd done. I really wish Jessica had appeared somewhere in Luke Cage's first season, given how prominent he is in Jessica Jones, and he was first introduced there. Um, I really would have loved to see her show up. Um, but yeah, overall... Um, the first season was good, fine. Um, it's it's not something I'd ever want to go back to. Um, so I don't know. Um, it's it's better than Iron Fist, um, and I like Defenders more just because there's a lot more to like in that show. But um, yeah, overall, it's the season. The first season was fine. But uh, yeah, I guess I might as well go into. Uh my thoughts i'm like the one person who doesn't at all mind most of the second half of season one of that show who just outright hate the second half there's some people who think it mainly falls apart in the last episode i enjoyed it i enjoyed all the diamondback stuff he's weird and goofy and silly but that whole stretch of that show is kind of what I want these shows to be in that it's it's past all of the sort of mob stuff and it's just Luke Cage fighting a supervillain and uh, as we'll get into it, season 2 that's what a lot of this season was and I enjoy that aspect of it I don't know I think I think a lot of why people dislike Diamondback has to do with the actor's performance and he is really leaning into the like 70s black spoil yeah black exploitation kind of cheesy element of it but on the page as written i think that character is better and easier to understand than people give it credit for like i feel like they're really upfront about what his deal is but a lot of people i know who dislike season two or not season two but the second half of season one will cite like I don't understand what Diamondback's deal is or why he does anything. And I'm like, but they make it really obvious and it makes sense to me and it's kind of compelling. But that's for a different discussion, I guess. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, for a while, before I revisited Daredevil Season 1 and before Punisher came out, Luke Cage was actually, like, my favorite of the Netflix shows for a little while there. And uh, it, it was really interesting to me that it came out like a couple of months apart from Doctor Strange because I actually found kind of thematic similarities between those two things where Luke Cage season one and Doctor Strange are both about not getting caught in the past and like moving forward with the progression of time. And I just thought that was a really interesting angle. And again, Diamondback stuff informed that a lot. And so I really enjoyed that show, and uh, um, I disagree with the idea that Jessica should have come back, mainly just because of the way that season one of Jessica Jones ends. Like, I don't know what I would have that character be doing, like, between then and the beginning of Defenders, and I wouldn't have her necessarily being, like, proactive and stuff. I don't know, it just feels like where we end Jessica off in her own show at that point, it would be strange to have her show up. Sort of like how Iron Fist does in this season. That's fair. It would have made more sense for her to show up 
in Luke Cage season two. Like Iron Fist did. It would. Oh, but you gotta wonder if maybe they're just wary about doing too much crossover stuff outside of like big crossover seasons. But really, that, I... that, that's the thing about Defenders. Like, we still aren't confirmed another season of that show, and um, yeah. I would like them to take advantage of the fact that they have these four shows and they all take place in the same world. And they've done a big Avengers-esque kind of crossover show before. Yeah, and it's just, that's, we've brought this up before, but I think that's the side effect of this crew or the people working on these shows not really knowing what they're doing. Unlike the movie division, they don't seem like they have a plan. But I, don't I wouldn't know. agree with that at all. Like, they have... I don't know. I feel like no one's really communicating past... That's, like, disagree with me on this if you want, but it's just... When we go from Jessica Jones Season 1 to Defenders, or from Defenders to Luke Cage Season 2, it feels like people know what stories they want to tell in a given season... And they're not necessarily worried about what's come before or what's coming after at all. Yeah, I agree with that. You're talking about the TV shows there. But you said just yeah, now yeah, that yeah. the movies don't know what they're doing. No, they no, no. I was... No, I'm saying, like, in contrast to the movies who very clearly do have a plan, the shows don't seem to. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, that is... Yeah, that's a problem. I agree with you. That's That's kind of a problem. Yeah, and it, it, it kind of puts a damper on it because, like, I enjoyed Luke Cage season one a lot, and I enjoyed this season fairly well, and uh, it just feels like, I don't know, part of this is just Defenders, and we'll get to this when we talk about Defenders, but one of my big problems with season two is that Luke kind of starts this season off in a weird place in terms of, like, his attitude. And I'm not sure what happened in Luke Cage Season 1 or Defenders to get him there. And that's like one of my big issues that affects me through the entire season. It's just like, how did Luke get like this? We should have seeded this in Defenders, but we didn't. I don't really have that at all. You have to elaborate more on that. Uh, okay, I guess... Yeah, I've sort of given my thoughts on season one. I liked it more than most people. I like the second half. I don't think it's as good as the first half, but it's not. It doesn't suddenly become a bad show to me, I don't think. But with season two, my whole thing is. And this is partially, it's like. I'll agree with you on the casting of Mike Coulter. He was perfect casting. He's able to. Like, we keep comparing Luke both in and out of the show to Captain America. And he does have that sort of Chris Evans, like... He almost feels like he just jumped out of a... like a PSA, but is still believably like a person who could exist. Like, Mike <laughs> Coulter and Chris Evans, with these characters, both have this kind of delivery where, like... Yeah, this is like a public figure... Like, the kind of guy that you see in commercials like, telling kids to stay in school and all that stuff. But at the same time, they're real people, and they sort of deliver it in, like, a good, cheesy way. And, like, you'll have characters like Claire telling Luke that he's cheesy, and it's endearing rather than, like, weird. And we, in Season 1 and in Defenders, we really play that he's... Of the four that we have, he's settled, and he's got his... Like, he's, he's really honorable, he's polite, even to, like, his enemies. He's, he's sort of the guy who's got it all figured out. And then in Season 2, which I don't think was set up by Defenders or Season 1 at all, he's kind of got this big ego. And, like, I guess maybe I can just say, alright, it's been a while, he's been off screen, he's been getting all this attention and praise that would well anyone's head a bit, but I'd have liked to see him get there. Like, it seems like he's got way more of an attitude and, like, uh, don't screw with me, like, I'm the best sort of egotism, and I don't know where that came from. Um, 
Okay, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying um, the, the ego stuff is wholly out of character. Um, I get why you have an issue with that. I don't necessarily feel like we needed to see that. I don't know. Like, the Defenders, I don't know how you would have gotten him to that place in Defenders, given the quote-unquote story they decided to tell throughout those episodes. It's, it's really more about, well, at least early on, it's Luke kind of doing his own thing and then getting entangled with the hand and all these different people that he doesn't feel like he belongs with in this world that feels so far from reality to him. And it's, it's about him learning to accept that and learn how to work as part of a team. Um, I don't really know how you fit him getting egotistical anywhere in there. I think just a few months of him being untouchable and helping out citizens and beating the crap out of bad guys with um, with little to no resistance is uh, enough. He's bulletproof. No one can touch him. He always wins. A few months of that, I buy that he's gotten to a place where I'm on top of the world and nothing can stop me. Yeah. yeah. That's your right. Yeah. Is that mixes with not just ego, but also all the stuff with like his dad and Claire, and that's like I, I am being a little unfair. That's a different thing, but that probably is what annoys me more in the sense that like his dad shows up and is played by Reggie Cappy, who's was great in anything he was in. Rest in peace. But we we keep talking about Luke's dad in season one, and he's a completely different person than what you're expecting once we actually meet him. And I like that in in the sense that like he's not just the stereotypical bad dad, but he's almost like too changed. Like, he gets on Luke's case about, like, how you're not invincible, no one's invincible, I... You're... You should respect me because I'm your father. But he seems like a really reasonable guy, and we as an audience get to see that he's, like, not a bad person anymore. And so when Claire keeps bringing it up, why don't you just talk to him? And Luke just refuses to listen and, like, throws a violent fit over it. It's, uh, I don't know, just a lot of stuff about Luke's attitude and the way that he reacts to things and talks to people for the first couple episodes. I want to say up until Claire leaves. Really annoys me. And you know why? I, I feel like part of why that bothers me is that I love Claire so much, and it feels like they were just looking for an excuse to get her out of the show. Yeah, because so, that's, exactly, that's exactly why that whole thing happened. I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, the actress wanted to take some time off. Rosario Dawson. Yeah, Rosario Dawson. She wanted to take some time off to um, spend time with her family. And ah. um, so the writers were like, oh, crap, well, we gotta find a way to write her out of the show. And oh, um, wow. see, That's really unfortunate. That is unfortunate. Um, so, like, that whole situation is contrived. Um, but I will disagree with you. Well, not disagree. I don't know. I feel like we will end up disagreeing on this, but for me, with that whole situation, I don't think Luke is thrown under the bus, necessarily. I mean, maybe I'm throwing, maybe I'm relating too much of my personal relationship with my own biological father to Luke, where his dad has been, like, really mean-spirited to him, and, uh, He's, he's been that way towards Luke for so long that Luke has just had enough and he's not willing to reconcile and I can totally understand that even if his father is now changed and is suddenly a good person why does Luke like why is Claire pushing that so hard on him where okay like you want him to have a relationship with his dad but if he doesn't want to that's his choice like just let him, let Luke live his life and he, if he doesn't Feel like he needs or wants his own dad in his life i think that's fine he should be allowed that space um and like during that whole argument 
when Luke gets mad and tells, tells her to stop talking and then punches the wall. Claire says she had some stuff with abuse uh, when she was younger, some stuff relating to abuse, and him punching the wall reminded her of that. But, I'm sorry, like, I don't buy that that's enough for her to just break up with Luke and leave. Like, we I still... Don't. And, I, I don't. Just, just let, me say my, let me say my bringing... piece on this. Let me say my piece on this. So, in back in season one, when we first met Claire, we see her um, meet Matt for the first time. The first time they meet, Matt gets dangerously close to the edge. Um, he throws that... Um, he throws one of those gangsters off of a roof. Well, is being really sadistic with him, telling him that he enjoys what he's doing, and then tosses him off that roof, and he lands in the garbage can. She, she sees that, she witnesses that, and then later has a physical and emotional uh, attraction to Matt. Now, they don't... She ultimately decides that... Because Matt is so close to being what he hates, she can't be with him. But she develops a genuine attraction towards him even after that. And I don't buy that that same woman would leave a man that she's already with over him getting mad and taking his anger out on a wall. I don't buy that. I do. I do completely. And this is actually me bringing my family experience into it. Where it's like, for the most part, I have a very good relationship with my family. But there are times when it's like, if someone takes out their anger on something physically, like, in your home, that, I think, creates an understandable fear that they will then take that out on you. She sees Matt be very violent and sadistic, yes, but she sees him doing it to, like, some gangster who's got a child kidnapped. That, there's a very, like, clear difference, I think, between seeing someone be violent like that and seeing someone be violent, like, to an inanimate over object. an argument that you're having. Because then, when he, like, gets angry and punches the wall, like, how is she supposed to take that other than implicitly, like, I could do this to you. Like, whether he wants to or not, if he gets angry enough, he's willing to destroy things in her house... What's to stop him from doing that again? That's an abusive environment. Like someone, uh, you, your significant other who you're living with gets angry enough that they start breaking things. That's not okay. That's different from being attracted to someone who hurts other people who are bad people. Okay, um, I'm gonna fight you a little bit on this. I, okay, so him, that's not a deliberate choice that's just an impulse that's just what he does in the moment to get his anger out um i don't think that's the impetus i don't think you can even see that for the impetus of abuse at all because that's a deliberate choice it's a repetitive thing it's premeditated um luke just in the heat of the moment he's frustrated he's angry he lashes out and hits the wall um but yeah, he, but I don't, I don't I think, think I can say it's a choice. I'm oh, sorry, you were lagging behind for a second. Oh, yeah, yeah I, was, I was just saying, like, that's... I disagree, that's not a choice. That's not a premeditated thing. That's just an impulse. Yeah, I can sort of see where you're coming from, but, like, you're right in the sense that it's not a repeated thing. But he does that one time, and if, that's enough for her Claire to just grew back up, up and leave. If Claire grew up in an abusive household, I think she would be worried about letting that, like, slide to the point where it can then become repeated. Because, like, you've got to be thinking on her level of, like, okay, if this is what he does when a conversation with his, like, loved one makes him angry enough, Okay, how is she gonna be sure that that never happens again? Well, like, if it's not a, a premeditated... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, Nick. I was just gonna say, at least have a conversation with the guy instead of just... Oh, he hit a wall? I'm done. That's it. We're not even gonna... Not even gonna try... Like, he hits a wall one time and it's... 
she's not even willing to have like a genuine conversation before she decides we're just gonna end this relationship right here and now. Well, to be fair, she does say she needs time. She, like, end it off cold, and by the end of the show, she does come back. So it's like, she just needs to get away for a bit. And that, I think, is completely understandable. Like, again, there will be moments where, like, family members of mine or people whose family I know will just, like, they'll experience something and it's not really violent, like, no one actually gets hurt, but they'll leave the house for a bit, like, for a couple of days. And I think that's what Claire is suggesting, and I think that's perfectly justifiable. Like, if Luke's not gonna listen to her and, like, deal with his daddy issues, because that clearly is a factor into why his attitude is changing. Like, his dad comes back, and suddenly Luke is way more violent with criminals and stuff. So if he's not going to listen to her, he needs to work his problems out, and she just needs, like, time away for a bit. I don't feel like, I mean, I see the correlation, sort of. I don't necessarily feel like those two things are related. I think the show is trying to tell us they're related. Okay, he he doesn't like that his dad is back. He still, he still harbors anger towards his dad, and so he kind of takes that out on the criminal's fights. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can I can see that. That may be a bit of a problem, but I mean, he's still reserved enough, or he's not putting them in the hospital. Uh, well, he did do it. Guy, cockroach. That's his name, right? See, it's it's been so long. I don't remember. I think. Like that guy needed to be uh, carried off by an ambulance. That's right. Yeah, he did hospitalize for that one guy. I remember that guy now. Yeah, that guy was a sleazeball. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you forgot that, I can see why that would contribute to, like, your reading of the situation. But that's, like... Yeah, that... He, he went overboard. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Um, I don't know. I just... I feel like both characters... More so Claire, at least for me, are thrown under the bus just because... We need an excuse to write the character out of the show because of the actress. I don't fault her for wanting to spend more time with her family, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I wish I wish they would have come up with a way to get her out of the show in a way that wasn't so character bashing, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, because it makes her look bad makes her look bad. And it's just... Honest, I, I, I can see maybe the writers not wanting to do this, but I personally would prefer it almost if we just did, like, the really classic sitcom thing of, like, oh, she had to go somewhere, like, between episodes, like, she got a call or whatever. Why don't we just do with her what we did with Fish, pretty much, where he gets a call about his daughter being sick, and he's like, hey, this daughter I barely know is sick, I gotta go, but I'll be back. Like, just do that. And then you can even still have the thing where, like, he shows up but not on screen in the last episode and so much has gone on with Luke that he's like, no, I don't want her to see me like this. Just let her, tell her to go away. I, I wouldn't have come up with some weird sitcom excuse like that. I would have just said, um, uh, family called, um, from out of state and a close relative died. I'm gonna go spend time with them and be there at the funeral. Simple, easy, understandable, done. Yeah. yeah. Or even just if you really wanted, you could, hmm, well, no, I guess, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like, yeah, you, you probably got it best, but I'm like, if they wanted to, they could say like, ah, something came up with Danny or something came up with Jessica. I gotta be out of town for a bit. But yeah, um, I think the simplest explanation, the better, and writing, writing pretty much the entire first couple episodes to build to that, the way they did, ah, I don't know, felt like a mistake. Yeah, um, we haven't talked about the villain of the season at all, um, Bushmaster. I, Bushmaster, Bushmaster, Bushmaster is so great, um, <laughs> that actor just carries so much presence in Gravitas. Yeah. And 
Yeah, he's he's got the presence and the gravitas, but also still, like Colta, he feels like just a guy, in the way that like when he's like with his friends or he's hanging around with like a Nazi and stuff, and they're just chatting. Like he feels like a guy you could just meet on the street somewhere and just hang out with. Like he doesn't feel like a villain all the time. Yeah, he's he's a very human character. Yeah. And like I'm glad we didn't kill him off at the end. I wanna see what we could potentially do with him in the future. I am glad we killed Mariah though. So glad we finally killed her. Uh, um Yes. She like okay. I, I she's like the her worst character. And I hate her, um in a good I guess in a good way, because you're supposed to hate her. Um Yeah. But uh, how do I how do I explain this? I just genuinely despised her. Almost every scene with her, I was cringing. Um, in a way, I felt like the show wanted me to, but all the Mariah stuff was, I don't, for for whatever reason, twice as hard for me to get through this season. I not that, not that any of it was badly written or anything. It's just I I like like the characters in the show. I just grew to despise her more and more as the season progressed. In a good yeah, way. I have that too. I, I didn't have a hard time getting through any of it. Except for the one conversation she has with her daughter, which is deliberately very disturbing and difficult to listen to. But, uh... Yeah, she's really, really hateable, and I love it so much. Like, TV shows, movies, whatever, she is just one of the most despicable people in this universe. And I'm so glad that we killed her when we did, because, like, we were reaching a breaking point. Of, like, you, you, if, if we found a way to contrive it so that she was still alive somehow, like, going to the next season, I'd be like, no, okay, this is just too much. Like, no one can be this awful and not suffer fatal consequences sooner rather than later. Like, she keeps digging her own grave, and it's so... I don't know, I find it great to watch just how despicable she is. And I like that Bushmaster's um, main goal this season was just crushing Mariah. And uh, he... You would think... Like, with a villain with that goal that really has nothing to do with the hero, Luke Cage could just step back and just let them take each other out, or, you know, just let Bushmaster take her out. But there's too many innocent people that are yeah. in the crossfire, and that's why Luke has to step in and stop him. And also, you have, like, the classic sort of villain hero standing, where initially. Uh, Bushmaster is worried that maybe Luke is like working for Mariah or he's like Mariah's bulldog or something. Especially because he, he ends up like just straight up protecting Mariah. Yeah. And that I will grant it sort of feels kind of a bit like contrived in the same way that Jessica Jones like needing to make sure that Kilgrave doesn't die so that she can have Hope be, like, exonerated does. Where it's like, we don't want our hero to want the villain dead until, like, late in the season, because if they wanted to, they could just crush their skull. Like, if Jessica wanted to, she could just murder Kilgrave in a couple seconds. Ditto with Luke and uh, Mariah. Or he could just step back, like you said, and let Bushmaster do it, and there'd be no problems. But we keep contriving ways for, like, no, they need to keep them alive. And I'm getting a little tired of that at this point. Like, I understand that's a byproduct of needing to have the same villain be around for 13 hours of television. But that, I think, is another thing that could be solved by what I suggested with Daredevil Season 1. Where it's like, let's just have a couple of different villains a season. That way we don't have to keep forcing it to where it's like, no, you can't get rid of them yet because of X, Y, Z reasons. Yeah, in uh, in Daredevil season one, we had um, the two uh, the two Russian brothers, Anatoly and uh, Vladimir, 
Um, yeah. We had Leland Owsley. We had um, Wesley Wilson Fisk. Um. The, uh, yeah, Madam Gal. We had like this really cool triad of uh, well, I guess I don't know what the word would be for that many people, but you know what I mean, like a whole group yeah. of villains. And it's like it's it's a great dynamic, but also it gives you the edge of like you can keep Fisk around, but still have it so that every couple episodes it feels like something significant happened, and it feels like we had a win or we had a significant loss, you know? Yeah. Whereas like, here, where we just have one villain the whole way through, it's like, we just kind of have to keep it in a constant back and forth stasis until the final episode. Yeah, and it does, it does start to feel repetitive in that way of like, we have Bushmaster try to kill Mariah or undermine Mariah's operation in some way. And then we have Luke stop it, rinse and repeat. Yeah, and that's sort of also not that Daredevil season one had this, but Luke Cage season one had it a little bit, which is another reason why I like the inclusion of Diamondback, where it's like, there's no way that uh, that season could have been as compelling with Cottonmouth as the villain the whole way through, because a couple episodes into season one, you realize. Okay, Cottonmouth talks a big game, but he can't actually make a dent in Luke. Like, we spend a couple episodes with just Cottonmouth exploring ways to defeat Luke and none of them working. Yeah. And just when I think the other going, okay, is Cottonmouth even really a threat? That's when we get rid of him and we bring in the new guy. And the new guy is sort of like in name the villain but it turns out that whole season was built into oh turns out mariah was the real big bad the whole time so we do have there it's a triad there we have like three big villains plus shades is to a certain extent like pulling strings getting things done we're allowed to have sort of a climax where one of them died and then we get to move on to other stuff here bushmaster is i guess you could say the villain of the season but it's all so mariah focused that it really does just feel like one big long plot um something else we haven't brought up yet uh well before i bring that up i just want to say yeah bushmaster was really good um i think mariah like her scenes with her daughter i think particularly towards the end were pretty powerful um, yeah, especially when she reveals that um, she's not actually like the person that she thought was her father wasn't actually her father, and that yeah. Mariah was raped by her uncle and like kept that a secret this whole time and like let her believe something that wasn't even true. That whole thing was just like it, it makes you sick to your stomach and your, your jaws on the floor and you're like, oh my god. Um, and she, she just overall does some really uh, despicable stuff. And uh, Shades, I found um, like the little side plot line with him and uh, his buddy who um, who was flipped for the for the feds. Um, I found that um, surprisingly interesting. Um, yeah, found myself kind of invested when um, that whole thing kind of blew up in his face and he found out his friend was working for the FBI and he had to shoot him and he actually feels a lot of remorse for it and that's the big catalyst to him flipping on Mariah yeah like, I appreciate that they go as far as to say like oh no they're not just friends like they they like were physical to help each other like get through prison life and, like, that's sort of a thing that, like, you hear about relationships in prison, but that I don't think I've seen, like, many TV shows explore, and I was not expecting this show to go there. And, like, Shades uses the word love, and, like, you can tell that it's... Like, because they've... We get... I, I, I think I'm right. I think I'm right in that they've known each other since they were, like, children... And like, yeah, what they feel for each other, platonic or romantic, is love, and they he has to kill him, and it's just 
Ah, it's such a it's a really powerful moment, I think. Yeah. And and especially um pretty much all his scenes afterwards. Like when he's getting interrogated by uh, Misty Knight and um you know, he's having flashes to what he did and just you, you see you see the pain in his face like from from that moment moving forward throughout the rest of the show. Yeah. Um, I know that actor from Sons of Anarchy. Um, he's really, really good, and I hope to see him in more stuff. Yeah, and um, at least also, so we can some yeah, sort we, of role in mean, whatever's coming next. Yeah, we can do stuff with him moving forward. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is Misty Knight, since we haven't brought her up yet. Um, uh, yeah, uh, no, I preferred her. In the first season, if I'm being honest, it's really only slightly, but just like it's it's not like a big like downgrade or anything. It's just I don't know. Maybe I'm just too used to her. Like now I've seen her in three seasons of something, but like watching season one of Luke Cage for the first time, I was like enamored with her, and like I could watch this lady in her own show. And here I'm just like, oh cool, it's more Misty. It's like I don't know. Maybe I've just like gotten enough of her to where I'm like. Okay, the novelty's kind of off, and I can just appreciate her as a support character. But before, I was like, oh, she's great. I maybe enjoy following her more than I do following Luke. Um, I don't know if I ever had that. But, um, I don't know. I really liked her this season. Um, and I, I did like that we, that we, like, were dressing her being armless for a while before um, before Danny had a robotic arm made for her. Um, yeah. Like, like her having to deal with being handicapped um, and still working as a, as a detective um, and like everyone judging her and um, patronizing her and you know, treating her like she's less of a person and like less of an officer just because and what happened to her, like, all that stuff and how she was reacting to it I thought was really well done. Um, yeah. We, we, we kind of, I want to say it's maybe episode four or five when we give her a new arm, maybe a little earlier. But I liked in the first few episodes that we addressed that and, um, and did some pretty uh, powerful stuff with it. I think it's <laughs> Is episode four the one with her and Colleen hanging out? Maybe. I, I only saw it once, um, so I don't know the show that well to say for sure what episode. Yeah, because I know for sure that uh, she doesn't have the arm yet as she's, like, palling around with Colleen. And that also is just great. Like, Colleen Wing is a character that I've been very mixed on in Iron Fist and Defenders, and we'll kind of talk about that as we get into Defenders, but here she's really fun. Like, with they they really capitalized on that whole Daughters of the Dragon dynamic, and, like, Misty, I think, brings out the best in her. I agree. Yeah. While we're on, Misty, and uh, I'd like to switch over to um, Danny, um, Iron Fist. Yep, that, that's who I would going to next he's finally tolerable <laughs> um yeah I didn't like his first season at all um more indifferent than hateful just because I call it belligerently boring before I call it straight up <laughs> bad <laughs> that show as a whole um like I don't know it's not straight up bad like say Transformers or uh, Twilight but it's just boring painfully boring him as a character the poor excuse for a story pretty much everything in that show just boring um, and then we get into in Defenders and he's, he's so obnoxious and so dumb and just <laughs> he's the worst um, yeah. and then and then we get him in this season, and it's like they finally got some people who have some reference for the character to write him, and got to play him well. 
Yeah, and it's just... I... I... I do think Iron Fist Season 1 is that bad precisely because it's boring. Or it's like, the action isn't good, there's not really anything interesting going on plot-wise, so it's down to the characters to keep your attention. And Danny is such a bad character. <laughs> like, he's immature, he's inconsistent, he's... Like, he's just so badly written that I was seriously questioning Finn Jones' acting talent. Because Jones, I don't think, ever gets the chance, even once in that season, to really give a good acting performance. He gets a little bit in Defenders and, uh, and in this episode. And I think what they maybe slowly came to realize over writing him is that he's at his most fun and Finn Jones as an actor is at his most, like... Uh, at his, he's at home the most and able to give the most real performance when Danny's just being kind of a chill dude. Like, they wrote him as a weird, petulant child with, like, serious anger issues. Like, it, it comes down to the idea that, like, he's literally looks like he's throwing a tantrum in almost every scene he's in in season one of Defenders. I mean, season one of uh, Iron Fist. But when he's allowed to just sit back and chill out and kind of be almost like a stoner funny guy, like, he's he's really, like, interesting and charming. And he's, like, the, the cool collected one when everyone else is about to flip their lid. And that's Iron Fist from the comics. Yeah. Um, and, it's like, the whole time I was watching that episode with him in it, I'm like, okay, I don't... Like, where were these people when they were making the Iron Fist show? Like, this is the people that they should have had writing that show. Or did they think that they had to spend a whole season with him like that to get him there? Where, again, is that, like, the problem with Iron Fist is that it's just 13 episodes of origin? Um, and even then, the quote-unquote origin is very loose and kind of ill-defined, really. I mean, he has a basic bare bones origin, but it's yeah. not it's not as interesting or fleshed out as Daredevil or Iron Man or Spider Man. Yeah, and it's just sort of like the man of thing. Like I, mean, I, I did a video about it. I think comparing it to Man of Steel and like Sherlock, the BBC show, where it's like, okay, we spend seasons and seasons are like hours and hours of movie time getting this character to a place where you could quote unquote believe that they are the person that they are in the comics or in the source material and like something we did with the BBC show Sherlock is that like we keep making it about like this weird melodrama and we don't really get to just be about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson solving mysteries until the end of season four where it's like, this is what it's been about the whole time. There I feel like this episode is that. Here, it's like, okay, we've got Danny Rand the Iron Fist. He's kind of like a chill dude who's worked out all of his stuff. He's in touch with his chi, and he goes around fighting people. I think they were like under the mistaken impression that they needed to get there over 13 episodes. So they're like... Now we can say, this is who Iron Fist is, and you only had to sit through an entire season of television for us to, like, build him to that person. It's like, you didn't have to do that. You could just do what the rest of these shows did, and let him be the guy who he's going to be from the very beginning. Because, like, with Matt in Daredevil Season 1, like, we build to him getting a, a suit and stuff. With Jessica Jones, we build to her, like getting publicly recognized as a superhero, but they're still the same people. Yeah, they are still the same people. Um, I, uh, I was very overall really, really pleased with, um, with that crossover with Danny. I thought it was great. Total, well, maybe not. Actually, yeah, I would say damn near a total overhaul of the character in the right direction. And, um, something else um, that that episode reminded me to, to talk about the action. I think they stepped up the action from season one. Yeah, 
there's only so much you can do in terms of action when, like, your thing is he's bulletproof and he's also not, like, formally trained in any kind of martial arts. No, he just but, they, of... but they, they shot that as stylistically and as unique as I think you could have. Yeah. And it's... And that once we get stuff like him on the bridge having his little duel with Bushmaster, it's like that's not typically how they would sort of frame these things, which I actually like as sort of a companion piece to his one-on-one -on -one fight with Diamondback at the very end of Season 1, because what I liked about that is that it's the final big fight between the hero and the villain at the end of the season but we're not necessarily treating it as the most, like, end-all, be-all, gravitas thing tonally. Like, this is Harlem. This is sort of tied in with a very New York sense of culture. And two guys break out into a fight on the street. What's going to happen? A bunch of people are going to gather around them and start, like, cracking jokes and placing bets. And that's that fight is allowed to be both climactic and sort of like lighthearted and like kind of funny in a weird way and here with the duel on the bridge it's a very nice looking daytime they're kind of having a little bit of a like they have a mutual respect it's not really a personal thing this isn't like the end of times for either character not all that much is at stake and it's it's a really interesting way to handle that kind of fight. Yeah, um, I like the fight. Um, Bushmaster, of course, um, obviously has dabbled in forms of martial arts. He's a lot more uh, skilled than Luke is. Um, and I just, I don't know, I still really like how that fight uh, plays out. Um, but that fight leads to what I think is the laziest bit of writing in the season. Um, is it out of the water? Yeah, it's the water thing. Like, <laughs> he gets paralyzed, and he's dumped in the water, and you're like, holy crap, how's he gonna get out of this? He's oh, just it just get out. wears off. It just wears <laughs> off, like, immediately, and he's able to swim away. Like, uh, yeah, that's really lazy, but at the same time, that's another thing where, like, you just shouldn't have written yourself into that situation because it would be just as lazy if anyone, like, conveniently found out what happened and was there in time to, like, fish him out or... And, like, we ask the question in season one and never get an answer of, like, why don't you just try drowning him? He's not impervious to drowning, is he? But apparently he's impervious enough that he can last long enough for that thing to just... Is that what we're supposed to take from it? Are we supposed to take from it that, like, Luke can breathe underwater longer than a normal person? And no! Like, don't talk it? Absolutely not. It's, yeah, because that doesn't make sense, but there's literally no other way for that to happen. Like, the only thing that can be taken from that scene is that Whatever Bushmaster poisoned them with that paralyzed him wore off in a matter of seconds, conveniently. Or like a minute at most. Yeah. Or maybe does it like dissipate in water? Who knows? It's just, it's weird if it's any of the things that we're suggesting they should have talked about it. Yeah, there has to be some conversation about that. Otherwise, aside from contriving uh, Claire leaving, it's the laziest bit of writing in the whole season, I think. Yeah, like, maybe even give Bushmaster a line, like, I decided in the end not to kill you, that's why I threw you in the water, I knew that the water would wear that stuff off. Like, have someone say something. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, that fight was great. Um, really, all the fights in this season are pretty solid. Uh, yeah, and, uh, hmm... The fights were solid, the visual direction was really solid. How do you feel about the music this season? I, I knew you were like going to ask me way... that. What'd you say? I said I knew you were going to ask me that. Yeah, just because I feel like it was way more intrusive and not as natural feeling as it was in season one. 
Yeah, that's that's a thing. Um, see, it wasn't like yeah, they do that really cheeky kind of cheesy thing of p- picking a song that has lyrics that conveniently describe what's going on in scene. Um, usually, well, I'm not even gonna say usually because that's not a thing I see a lot. But um, I don't know that that kind of thing makes me chuckle and roll my eyes as opposed to cringe but uh yeah i don't have a huge opinion of that it was kind of whatever kind of just made me laugh at the show it was just unintentionally funny to me yeah i don't really have a problem with a lyrics i'm just thinking more of like uh like in the first season when we do like the scenes of music being played in the club It's always, like, set against something, like plot progression, or there's always something going on while that's happening. Here, I think there's at least twice where we just, we just straight up just have an entire song just play for, like, three or four minutes in the club while nothing else is happening. And it's like, okay, it's a great song. That's, those are the few moments in the show where I can tell, like, oh, you guys are really padding and stretching this stuff out because you don't you don't have a clear direction for a story that takes this amount of time to tell. And maybe if I'm being nice, giving the benefit of the doubt, maybe it's the level of like, okay, we're representing a culture here. We're putting on a lot of not well-known art- artists, so we're kind of using this very popular wide like widely distributed show as a way to like showcase talent and fine that's admirable i guess but at the same time you're trying to tell a story here like don't don't take up so much time on this guy's wicked guitar solo because it's a great guitar solo but it really has nothing to do with anything yeah um so yeah overall um i remember the music like, I remember a lot of the music in season one, um, like, being stuff that, like, oh, well, I'd, I'd like to download this and just listen to it. Um, and I don't really have that with any of the songs in season two. Not that any of them are bad, or that I disliked any of them. Just, uh, they didn't really speak to me, and they didn't, they accentuated the scenes, for the most part, but they didn't pop. Yeah, I can song where it's like I I thought as much oh I wanna find that song and listen to it recreationally and I had that with a couple of songs in the first season but not really with anything here um one other thing um I wanna mention though before we move off music um I really like Luke Cage's score yes like just something I forgot to mention in talking about season yeah the the score um like especially when um we do fight scenes with luke fighting someone who can actually give him a challenge we'll do like i don't know how to popular pop properly articulate it but we do almost like a choir kind of like i really like choir score in the background i really like that i don't know that Luke's signature score, I think, is really, like, I don't know if subtle is the right word, but I could instantly pick it out. Yeah, like his theme, like the... Yeah, that. Yeah, it's such a, it's like, that's not immediately where your head would go for, like, musical motifs for a character like this, but it's really fitting. It's sort of like... It's kind of got a reverence to it. Like, we we have a lot of characters talk about Luke like he is a very... He's, he's a very public hero. He's looked up to by a lot of people. And he's not Matt or Danny or Jessica. He's a public figure. And this is kind of like a hymn for a guy that everyone loves and respects and, like, has... He's like a folk hero. He is a folk hero, and this is a very folk hero type sound. Um, I have a question for you. 
would you want to see another season of the show? Uh, that's because I'm in a weird situation where, like, I know we're not getting a Defender season two, but at this point, so long as it was written better, I'd just take a bunch of Defenders over any of these guys having individual seasons. Anymore. Like, I'm looking forward to Daredevil season three, just because. I think of these, he has proven, like, the most, like, yeah, a Daredevil show. That makes sense. Just him and his rogues gallery carrying a season of television. But I feel like just the way that these shows have handled these characters so far, and, like, their villains and stuff, I could do, I could deal with just season after season of, even if it's not the four of them working together all the time, just have the four of them be in one show, where it's like, okay, this episode we'll see what Luke's doing, this episode we'll see what Jessica's doing. Every couple episodes they'll, like, cross paths, or two of them will work together, three of them, or they'll work as a foursome. But, like, I don't know, I just feel like the way that we've been doing it so far, it's not necessarily the best idea to be like, okay, 13 hours, just go. With this main character fighting one or two villains, for an entire season. It's just, it's not working as great as it could, I don't think. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. Um, especially for Daredevil. Um, that's, that's my second favorite um, superhero of all time. I think season one is still the best comic book adaptation we've had. And um, I, I, I really like season two a lot. It is very problematic, and we'll, we'll get into that when we get into Daredevil season two. But I think Daredevil is the most consistent and still the best show out of all these shows, easily. And um, I am very excited for season three. Um, I am very worried though because the showrunner has changed. It's not um, it's not a uh, Stephen Denight anymore. It's uh, Eric Olson who wrote um, a pretty good chunk of episodes from Arrow season three. Most of which were done. So that's utterly terrifying. But uh, I, I don't know. We still have most of the same writers. So hopefully um, they can still um, maintain uh, the quality of that of that show. Um, and, and like I said, they're adapting uh, Born Again and apparently Guardian Devil, which are two of Daredevil's best stories. So I pray to God they don't neuter those. And, and, and that they and that they do yeah. this. I agree but. with you about Daredevil. Like, I think we'll mostly agree on season two because, like Luke Cage season one, I think I like that more than a lot of people. Yeah. But it's I don't know. I feel like all of these shows, just like as a collective entity, need an overhaul of some kind. Whether it's each character's like individual seasons being structured differently or less episodes or just putting them in a show together i think there has to be like some big change in the way that these things are like handled and presented and distributed because outside of daredevil and i love punisher and i really like luke cage season one and jessica jones season one but i think it's sort of starting to backfire on them the idea that they have to basically do 13 hour movies for each of these characters every couple of months i i think they're stretching themselves really thin trying to keep up that formula um and, that and that's see um the, the the whole situation with these netflix shows is really interesting um i've been looking into them in preparation for this uh so when the netflix deal was first announced right we knew that we were getting Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, and they would all combinate in the Defenders. Um, all that was planned out. Um, I do think they shot themselves in the foot, though, when they they put Defenders on that slate, um, not knowing if all the shows would hit the mark, because most people would agree Iron Fist certainly didn't. And... A lot of people, I think, like, for the most part, 
um, Jessica Jones was pretty well received, especially critically. When you look at audiences, though, a lot of people found it fairly boring. I mean, most people still liked it, still enjoyed it, but you did get a pretty good chunk of people that just found it boring. And they came out of that show saying the only reason they watched it was for David Tennant and being Doctor Who fans. Um, so, I think, uh, well, first of all, with, with all that in the announcement, they also announced that all the shows would be a certain number of episodes. Um, that was just in the contract. So they had to make every episode 13. Um, with, with them renewing the contract, um, since Defenders was finally done, um, that is no longer the case, which is why season two of Iron Fist is just 10 episodes. Um, so hopefully that'll be more st streamlined and it'll actually be a decent story this time around. But yeah, with their first go around with these shows leading up to Defenders, they all had to be 13, with the exception of Defenders, which was just uh, 8. Um, but, but now that that's no longer the case, and they can make them whatever episode they need them to be, that's what they should do. Not everything should match up to 13. Yeah, but it's yeah, also so weird. Defenders. Yeah. Side, there's a weird echo, but like, it's also weird in the sense that Defenders was only eight episodes, but even those eight episodes felt kind of padded and like it didn't even need to be that long. So I don't even know if it's episode count so much as just like the approach that they're taking to writing these, where I feel like they. You could easily, like, if they followed my suggestion, where we did, like, a couple or more villains a season, and have it, like, split up into more clean-cut arcs, sort of like the way that a lot of animes will do it, where those will be one sort of long story over X amount of episodes, but they'll sort of cut it into, okay, this chunk of episodes 1 to 13 is gonna be this bad guy. This episode, like, 14 to whatever, 23, we'll, do, we'll deal with this dude and this plot line. I feel like you can do that, like, to scale. Like, episodes 3, uh, 1 to 3, or 1 to 4, for Luke Cage Season 3, let's have it be this bad guy. Episodes 5 to whatever can be something else. And I just... Like, that's the one thing that I think the, uh, the Arrowverse CW shows have over these is those seasons are actually like way longer in terms of episodes and runtime but they don't feel as padded or as sort of slow because we're doing a lot and we're getting a lot of different things done and we're exploring a lot of plots and a lot of villains and a lot of scenarios i don't see why these shows can't do that these guys have a lot of comic book villains to like and even if you don't want to take just from villains that they've actually fought in the comics, there's a lot to crib from. And you can make 13 episode seasons of whatever, or 14 episodes or 20 episodes that don't feel like a million years long, because they're allowed to do a couple of different things instead of one plot line for an entire season, one good guy, one bad guy, all the time. Like that, that also I think, is something to work on well daredevil set the precedent for this right that's both the best and the worst thing about it is it is essentially a 13 hour movie and it is uh fairly deliberately paced um but like they're always furthering character and story throughout every single scene but we don't have that yeah. in the shows. um like um i'm sure you're gonna roll your eyes and probably anyone who's listening to this is gonna roll their eyes but Teen Wolf is um another one of those shows where um it is it's straight up serialized and each season is a movie and there's not really anything that you could skip or cut um and and Daredevil is is, is the epitome of that now not every other show has or needs to be that um that's, that's where I think the issue lies, is everything is trying to be that exact. We have to tell a long, overarching story 
and we can't have any kind of one-offs. Yeah, and see, it's not even just that, like, one-offs in the sense that you could cut it out and not lose anything. Well, but yeah, but, like, like, when you look at shows like of- Arrow and Flash, how they, they'll do, like, a villain of the week, but they're furthering character, and so... Um, you still wouldn't cut that episode because of where the characters get from A to B. Yeah, but even without, like, Villain of the Week stuff, like, what I think Daredevil and, to use Teen Wolf as an example, what Teen Wolf and Daredevil have over the rest of these shows is that even though they are, like, one plot line over an entire season with one overarching big bad, each... Not each episode, but a lot of episodes do still have the sense of, like, Alright, this is the conflict for this episode. Like, and that allows you to have a sort of catharsis. Where, in Teen Wolf, we'll have an episode where it's like, Okay, the main characters are trapped in a school. There's something in there with them. We're not sure what, but they have to get out safe. End of the episode, the situation situation is dealt with. They're out safe. The conflict has been resolved. And with Daredevil, like, an episode is, okay, Matt is stuck in this building with Anatoly and they're surrounded by cops. How are they going to get out? Episode ends. Matt's on his way out of that situation. Conflict has been resolved. We don't do that with any of the rest of these. Like, we don't allow any conflicts to, like, be done in just an episode. Like, it's constantly just one conflict building and building and building, and it's not over or resolved until the end. And, like, you don't have to make your episodes filler plot-wise in order to achieve that. You just have to make the end of an episode feel like an ending. I agree. And when you do that, that makes them more memorable, as opposed to just they all just run together and blend together in your mind. When you give your episodes um, definitive endings, but like you, you're obviously going to have more story. Um, it it locks your show in, like with the audience, and like I like even just with my first few viewings of Daredevil, I could tell you exactly when Kingpin kills the guy with his car door, or the episode where um, where Matt gets stuck with. Um, Vladimir in the warehouse like I could tell you all that stuff because um, the episodes have clear beginning middle and ends and they don't just blindly run together but uh, yeah I know what you're saying and like we'll get into this with uh, season two of Daredevil but it has that too where the Punisher is a factor throughout that entire season but we like, his introduction up until him getting caught by the police is, like, a very clean beginning, middle, end, four-episode arc. Episodes one, two, three, and four are the Punisher arc for that season. Episode four ends. You could almost, like, stop watching that season past that point. Like, you have the hook of, like, okay, who's this lady in Matt's house? But we've got, like, a whole story in that four episodes, and it's allowed to have... A, ca- a catharsis and we'll pick up with that character and what happens to him later in a very short time but we're allowed to like take a moment to be like all right this was this sort of like plot and we're done with that for now and none of the other shows outside of daredevil i think have that and it's a not real really now um and we'll talk more about this when uh when we get to defenders but I, I do really appreciate um, some of the stuff that we do with uh, with Matt and Jessica, especially in that show. Yeah. But uh, we're getting really off track. I don't know. I guess, have we said everything we wanted to say about uh, Luke Cage Season 2? Or uh, is there any other big things that you think stick out? Um, nothing sticks out. Um, I, I just want to cap this off by saying I think this is where you can well i don't know G- given the ending i think it is a really interesting premise to start with a third season but honestly i can kind of take or leave one at this I point think we should talk because you asked if i wanted a third season i could take leave it honestly but i guess 
we should talk about just how we feel about the ending as an ending to this season. I... I'm still not sold on the idea of Luke, like, becoming a crime boss. Like, that just doesn't sit right with me. And, like, I know we build to it, and it's, like, the only way to stop further violence. It's just... The way we frame it as, like, oh no, Luke's on the side of crime now. Like, ah, the way... It, it, it feels weird. It feels wrong for this character as we've established him so far um that's for, for me i think that's the point it's supposed to um yeah. you see him standing in that in that uh in that position that cottonmouth was standing in and you're like this is this is wrong this is straight up wrong this should not be happening and you're like what is going to happen after like like does this does this corrupt luke um, we do play Luke as, like, as you were saying, we keep referring to him as Captain America and comparing him to Captain America. Captain America is incorruptible. Um, yeah. To a, to a certain point. Um, we see that waiver in Civil War um, when he wants to protect Bucky and, um, and be able to do the right thing for people regardless of whether or not it's illegal. But, uh, yeah, with Luke him taking this position of the crime boss of Harlem um is is this something that could potentially corrupt him could he become so, everything that he hates i think that's an interesting question to pose i think that's interesting i think that's where we're sort of split on the issue where it's like you could take it as the worry is will this position corrupt him to me, it's an issue of he's already corrupt for taking it in the first place. Uh, I, I see it. That's totally fair. That's totally valid, yeah. Yeah, so that's just sort of how I take it, and that's a really weird note to leave this character on for the foreseeable future. But I don't know. Like, if and when Season 3 comes out, and it's a really, really interesting, like, look at that, it'll be justified, I guess. But I'm just, I'm kind of I don't know, is Season 3 confirmed yet? It's not, no. Um, yeah, so with no Season 3 confirmed, and no Defender Season 2 confirmed, that's a weird place to maybe leave that character for a while, if not for good. I kind of get the impression, like, I know this is, that they built to this really from Episode 1, but, um, I don't feel like this is a story that you would tell without knowing for sure that you can further it later. Yeah. Like, if you're going to get Luke, Luke to that place at the end of your season, you'd think you'd have another season in the bag so that you could further expand on that. But who knows? It could just be an open-ended cliffhanger if you know what would be we're not getting more. You know what would be interesting is if um, Iron Fist Season 2, or Daredevil Season 3, or Jessica Jones, whatever, if we do kind of what we did here, where Luke will show up for an episode, but he's a problem, like, even if he's not being, like, a bad guy, like, he could be causing issues for the other Defenders, rather than fixing problems. I mean, how does that sound? Um, that sounds, that sounds interesting. Um, I, I'm very conflicted on whether or not I, um, I want a season three. I mean, I guess, like I said earlier, I could just take it or leave it. Um, one more thing I want to mention real quick before we, before we sign off is, uh, I really appreciated, um, that we were integrating so many of the other characters and just mentioning some of the other characters from the other shows, like, Karen, and especially Foggy. Um, Foggy showed up a fair amount in the show, and I really appreciated that. Especially since um, we know that they're doing the Born Again storyline for Daredevil, and we and we get to see Foggy be be um, a lawyer away from Matt a little bit more. And I think that's really important since we know that Kingpin is going to be gunning for both Matt and Foggy once he finally gets out of prison. Yeah, and I mean, you could also do the thing where 
instead of being a problem. The fact that Luke suddenly has mob ties could make him an asset. Like, there's a problem where, like, Fisk has power here, and, like, Matt needs something done. It's like, okay, Luke has his own territory, pretty much, and he can get in favors, and, like, that then becomes a question of, like, okay, this guy I used to work with who seemed, like, morally on the level, now he's a crime boss, and what does that mean for the other defenders if they continue to, like, work alongside him like that? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, proposition for the future. Um, but yeah, overall, this was in... I don't want to say improvement over... See, well, yeah, I'll go that far. I'll say it's... I'll go as far as saying it's an improvement over Season 1. Um, just for Bushmaster alone, I think he's instantly more compelling than any of the villains that we had in the first season. And, um... Aside from what we do with Claire, just to get her out of the show, um, and some of the Mariah stuff that I think could have been cut, I think this was overall pretty solid. I think season one had higher highs and lower lows. This one I feel like generally had more control of the quality the whole way through. I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah, and just, I don't know, there's, there's never a moment where I was like, not engaged, except for, like I mentioned, just the overly long song numbers where we just focus on nothing but the music. But uh, for the most part, I think it just suffers from... Like, we know where we want the story to begin, we know where we want it to end, and we have to fill 13 episodes, so let's just constantly have characters like allegiances and plans shifting on a dime. And, like, that kind of approach can be really compelling. But, I don't know, here it feels a little bit... Lazy's not the right word. It feels a little bit desperate. Like, we want to do the Bushmaster stuff, and we want to do the Luke and his dad stuff, and we want to do all the Mariah stuff. But we take, like, the most con convoluted, like, least simple approach to all of those things to fill the 13 episodes. And so I really think it's structure biggest problem. Performances and all of the characters as written and the action is great and all that stuff is fine. It's just the way that we chose to structure the plot is, I feel, kind of a weakness. I would agree. I would agree. Well, um, I think we have covered... Um, as much of this as we possibly could without veering uh, too much off topic for other stuff we'll get into, like Defenders and Daredevil. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And Daredevil see you next, then. So, uh, until then, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.